Good afternoon to everybody joining us. Um, I'm Marcia Turnus, and I'm here with Mike Pitton in the Bar Association offices. <clears throat> this is a new process for us, so it's kind of unnerving to be talking to a group of people that we can't see. Um, but we do welcome you all. I think we're around 30 people here today, so um, we're, we're happy to be here. Christy normally introduces the speakers, but she is not in the office today, so we'll give you just a really brief recap of who we are before we get started. Again, my name's Marcia Turnus. I practiced here in Des Moines. I did an insurance defense practice for about 16 years, and then I was appointed to the Iowa Supreme Court in 1993 by uh, Governor Branstad. I served for 17 and a half years until 2010, and since then I have been uh, in my own little private practice. I do uh, consulting on appeals and trials, and I do arbitration, which is why I'm here today. And I'll let Mike explain uh, his background for you before we get started. Well, thank you, Marcia. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm an attorney uh, in Iowa City located in private practice. I'm licensed in the, and practice in the states of Iowa, Minnesota, and Illinois. Uh, been doing arbitrations for many years, both for AAA and uh, for private, uh, under private circumstances. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Iowa College of Law, uh, teaching arbitration law and practice for about the last 15 years. I also coach the uh, Iowa uh, arbitration teams that participate annually in the ABA arbitration competition. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on arbitration and perhaps uh, help in terms of your uh, various practices and, and work on behalf of corporations. So we'll kind of work through our slides. We can take questions uh, if you do have those. So feel free to uh, to jump in at any time. Uh, you do. Thank you. Okay. We're being told that if you do want to ask a question, it's best to use the chat box rather than the question box. Either works, but chat is better. All right, and we start with uh, words of wisdom from Benjamin Franklin way back when. By way of historical context, um, arbitration started with uh, merchants trying to get disputes resolved in an expeditious way while maintaining relationships among themselves. Uh, since then, arbitration and related laws have been codified in state and federal statutes, and we'll talk about those. Uh, it's our feeling that uh, arbitration is an invaluable resource and perhaps underutilized in Iowa. Uh, as we go through this, we're hoping that you consider the, con uh, the contracts that you presently have that contain arbitration clauses and also uh, consider your know, pending issues that might be better resolved by arbitration. And here we're going to first talk about governing laws. You know, what laws will regulate arbitration? We have state and federal laws that are involved. Um, you'll find the chapter uh, 679A governs arbitration in the state of Iowa. Now there's, uh, you want to keep in mind as you think about enforceability, we'll start with, that um, there's a distinction in enforceability between Contracts are arbitration agreements that relate to uh, future disputes, pre in other words, pre-dispute arbitration agreements, and those that relate to existing disputes. In Iowa, under 679A1, uh, there's a restriction on enforceability of pre-dispute arbitration agreements that relate to contracts of adhesion, contracts between employers and employees, and tort claims, with an exception noted there. Um, there are no such restrictions uh, if it's an existing dispute uh, that's being arbitrated. So then as we go to uh, 679A, one of the conditions is that um, any of these arbitration agreements likewise are not enforceable if the contract is revocable and we see claims made based on fraud, duress, unconscionability, 
and lack of mutual assent are the primary ones that the court uh, has considered. The, uh, there's also an aspect of this that you want to be aware of, which is called the separability doctrine. And with respect to that, um, the doctrine uh, provides that arbitration agreements are separable from the contracts in which they are embedded. So if there's a challenge to the underlying contract, what you'll find is that the courts typically will uh, separate the arbitration agreement, which they may find to be valid, even in a contract that is otherwise invalid. So the case may very well proceed to arbitration uh, in any event. In terms of federal, yeah, we can do it next. Okay. Federal, whoops. We'll get this uh, PowerPoint <laughs> down for you. Uh, in terms of governing federal law, the Federal Arbitration Act is a bit different than Iowa. Uh, federal Arbitration Act comes into play for contracts that involve interstate commerce or maritime transactions. Now, one thing to consider is the court very broadly construes interstate commerce um, to essentially involve transactions or contracts between parties who are either engaged in inter interstate commerce or who are in an industry that's engaged in interstate commerce. And the important aspect here is that the Federal Arbitration Act has different enforceability provisions. Uh, they do not, it does not recognize uh, the restrictions on pre-dispute arbitration agreements in the context of uh, contracts of adhesion or employment agreements. So what you'll oftentimes find is that uh, in a contract where there is such a restriction and one looks to the Iowa Code, uh, the courts in many cases, if not most cases, will find that the Federal Arbitration Act preempts the Iowa Code as in conflict um, with that based on the Supremacy Clause provisions. Under the Federal Arbitration Act, there are no restrictions for pre-dispute clauses as long as we have interstate commerce, maritime transaction, and there are no grounds for revocation. There is a requirement that the agreement be in writing, though, however. Okay, well, now that Professor Pitton has educated us on some of the uh, laws that provide a context for arbitration, the rest of our uh, presentation is going to be focused on some of the practical aspects of how you might choose to use arbitration or whether you will choose to use arbitration and how you will use it. One thing that we want to caution from the very beginning is that if you take the same baggage that has made litigation so lengthy and expensive with you into the arbitration process, You'll, you will not tap into the potential of arbitration to have a speedy, cost-effective, and just resolution to your client's dispute. So the participants in an arbitration have to be committed to doing things a bit differently. Otherwise, you're going to fall into the litigation hole, as this our young man on the slide uh, is contemplating his options, and end up with arbitration bearing the same price tag and delay as traditional litigation in the courts. So let's turn to some of the benefits that can be achieved with arbitration. Control of the process is a benefit, but it's kind of also the overarching uh, aspect of arbitration that makes it something that you'll want to consider. The parties have control of the process. It might be ahead of time in the way you draft an arbitration agreement, but it can also occur after the dispute when both parties see value in arbitration and go about uh, creating a process that will be beneficial for their clients. Uh, one of the aspects that is particularly attractive about arbitration is that arbitration hearings are not open to the public and the entire proceedings as well as the decision can be made subject to a confidentiali confidentiality agreement as well. So if it's a case that uh, might have some adverse uh, uh, publicity ramifications or trade secrets or really anything that might prompt your client to not want it to appear in the paper, uh, arbitration is a, a great route to go. Arbitration also has the advantage of more likely preserving business relationships. Now, 
Sometimes when there's a dispute between people who do business together or companies who do business, the relationship is not salvageable. But if there's an ongoing uh, relationship between two companies who have a dispute, there's more than money at stake. The parties often want a resolution that not only resolves the dispute, but does so simply and quickly and as quickly as possible to avoid fanning the flames of disagreement and having it extend so long that these business colleagues see themselves as advers adversaries. So a quick process with limited discovery that arbitration can add can resolve a dispute with a little less contentiousness and less damage to ongoing business and personal relationships. Now the next three items that have asterisk we're going to talk about in detail after this slide, so I'm going to skip those, but those are all very important and probably the, the most important um, aspects or benefits of arbitration. Arbitration, of course, is done in an informal setting, and oftentimes that reduces stress on the parties, the witnesses, and the attorneys. It is possible to have a customized award in uh, arbitration that avoids one of the common um, fears of litigation, and that is who knows what's going to happen. You can get a big goose egg, plaintiffs can get nothing, and defendants face the fear that a jury is going to go wild and award far more damages than would be anticipated. So one way to have a customized award is to enter into a side agreement where the uh, uh, award is more or less boxed in. Now this is an agreement between the parties, not shared with the arbitrator, where the parties agree that regardless of the decision, it cannot, the, the money uh, recovered or paid cannot go below a certain amount or go above a certain amount. So the defendant would agree that even if the arbitrator decides there's no damages, the defendant will still pay the plaintiff a certain amount. And the plaintiff agrees that even if the damages um, are above a certain limit, the uh, defendant will not be responsible for anything beyond that limit. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in more detail later. And finally, one aspect of arbitration that litigants often find to be beneficial is the finality. The arbitration's decision is final. There aren't any appeals from the arbitrator's award unless, of course, the parties include a three-judge panel of arbitrators to hear appeals from arbitrations, but that's not usually done. The grounds to have an award vacated by the court are limited and motions to vacate are seldom granted. So the uh, finality aspect of this is one way to achieve a fast resolution. Uh, briefly about the choice of decision makers and why that can be seen as a benefit. Of course, when you choose an arbitrator, you want to consider some uh, obvious qualities. The neutrality of the uh, potential arbitrator, arbitrator. Attorneys acting as arbitrators are ethically required to disclose potential conflicts, so you'll have information to judge the neutrality. Of course, you want someone who has um, a history of fairness and impartiality. Often parties are looking for somebody not just with knowledge and expertise about the trial or arbitration process, but also uh, expertise in a particular area of the law. And if that is important, the parties can choose an ar arbitrator who has that expertise. And to explain what I'm talking about, I'm sure some of the people listening to this are in the insurance industry, which is uh, one area that I'm a little bit familiar with from my private practice, say that you have a dispute between an insurance, primary insurer and an excess insurer or a reinsurance company. Uh, if you are litigating that in court, you could get a judge who has never had an insurance case their entire career, maybe join the bench from the county attorney's office. You might feel more comfortable having somebody with some expertise in your uh, area of law making the, the decision. And so that's one of the benefits that you get from arbitration. You can uh, choose one arbitrator or a panel of three arbitrators. Uh, sometimes um, people believe that the cost and practical problems associated with scheduling and everything with the three-member panel outweigh the benefits. Others think that collegial decision-making produces better decisions by decreasing the chance that important points would be overlooked or misunderstood by a single arbitrator. And obviously the parties in drafting their 
pre-dispute or post-dispute arbitration agreement and set out the methods for choosing the arbitrator. Right, and to follow up and capsulize some of that, this is a forum that is arbitration where the parties have the opportunity to select their own rules, their own procedures, the location of the hearing, the dates, and the decider um, with an, in an informal setting with a great deal of finality involved. Um, as Marsh had indicated, there are no traditional routes of appeal generally in arbitration. It scares away some attorneys, but there are some grounds for appeal. And we did provide in our materials uh, the Iowa Code related to arbitration 679A. And if you care to take a look under 679A.12, uh, section 1A to D, there are grounds to vacate an arbitration award generally related, on, uh, related to misconduct, bias, or interest of the arbitrator. Um, the Iowa Code does have a bit of an expanded uh, alternative for review as well, uh, which we'll talk about. But um, by and large, in terms of faster resolution, we have flexible scheduling. We can schedule these hearings on the attorneys and the party's calendar, and the arbitrator is very cooperative generally. And if you need to break up the time over a period of weeks, that can be done as well. Streamlined discovery, um, that's one benefit of arbitration that troubles some attorneys, but by and large, uh, there's an unlimited exchange of documents by way of discovery. Um, there are alternatives for taking depositions in a limited capacity but some of the traditional forms like interrogatories that everybody loves to generate and loves to answer so well are not part of the arbitration process typically. Uh, the reduced time to award is a significant benefit. You can essentially get a hearing, get a determination, and have an award issued uh, based on the time frame of the attorneys and the arbitrator, which may be a matter of weeks, months, um, but certainly not years and years, uh, as sometimes is the case with court proceedings. And then the finality aspect we addressed a bit, but the idea is the arbitration decision is supposed to be final. Very limited grounds for appeal, uh, as, as I had mentioned. Um, also, reduce cost. Now, this is one thing that is subject to some debate currently. Does arbitration really reduce the cost? And there, there are several aspects that would need to be considered. Um, first of all, granted, there's a filing fee for arbitration. And one of the concerns that have been raised with some sponsoring organizations is that that filing fee can be quite high. Uh, also, you're paying for an arbitrator, so you're paying for a private judge in effect. Uh, however, the fact that there's generally streamlined motion practice, uh, very few pre-hearing hearings on procedural matters, uh, limited discovery. Typically the costs would be and should be much less than traditional litigation. The current debate that's going on a bit is the formalization of arbitration. Should arbitration um, gravitate towards the practice of litigation where the parties can utilize the rules of civil procedure uh, for a motion practice, can utilize all the forms of discovery. And arbitrators do vary when it comes to their discretion as to how much discovery should be appropriate in a given case. But when it comes to reduced cost, control of discovery is a big part of that, and the arbitrator typically can help. Relaxed rules of evidence. Um, Usually, most evidence comes in for what it's worth in the record, and then the arbitrator weighs the, or gives the appropriate weight to the evidence, so that in lieu of perhaps experts or lengthy testimony, reports oftentimes come in, and, and hearsay to some extent, as Marsha will be talking about. A uh, court reporter is not required. You do have the alternative to have a court reporter in an arbitration proceeding generally, and that's something that either by agreement with the other party or the discretion of the arbitrator can be done. Um, one of the things to point out is 
There's a different standard of review that may apply for post-award motions to vacate an arbitration award uh, if there is no court reporter or record made. And there, if you care to take a look, it's at 6798.12, and it's under 1, uh, parentheses F. And what that provides is that a ground for review is substantial evidence on the record as a whole. Um, however, that ground does not apply under three circumstances. Uh, one is that the arbitration proceeding has not been reported. So if there is a potential for appeal, something to consider having a court reporter there. Uh, the other two is if the parties have agreed that that's not a ground to utilize for vacating an award. And the third, interestingly enough, is if the arbitration is conducted under the auspices of American Arbitration Association. So when it comes to a court reporter, something to consider if, if you expect further proceedings beyond the award. I just wanted to add to something that Mike said because it was a pet peeve of mine when I was in private practice and it gets back to the faster resolution aspects of arbitration and the fact that the parties control the process for scheduling. I think all of us have been bumped from a trial date because there's no court reporter or the judge has to take something that has higher priority. And so arbitration to me is attractive because when the parties set a trial date absent some, you know, emergency with one of the arbitrators or the council. When you set a date, it's going to be firm. It's not going to be continued because of something that comes up at the last minute that can so frequently happen with traditional litigation. Because we are allowed to talk about our pet peeves, aren't we? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, we're going to go a little bit more into the relaxed rules of evidence because this isn't something I think that you can find written down anywhere. This is how arbitration hearings are handled by arbitrators. And of course it can vary from arbitrator to arbitrator and it's possible that some party, uh, some parties might have an arbitration agreement that requires application of the rules of evidence. But the fact that rules of evidence do not have to be applied as they are in a trial and generally are not applied as they are in a trial, at least not totally, adds to the informality of the process and it adds to the uh, speed with which uh, evidence can be submitted. As Mike said, um, whoops, well and, and also of course the, the timeliness or the time of the hearing being shortened add, adds to the cost benefits. But for example, as Mike alluded to, the parties can agree to submit into evidence expert reports, depositions, um, affidavits without having the expert deponent or a client present at the hearing. So that shortens the time for the hearing substantially or at least can and certainly uh, avoids the cost of bringing in medical experts or engineers or what have you. Generally evidence is admitted uh, when it is of the kind on which reasonably prudent persons are accustomed to rely for the conduct of their serious affairs, even if it would be inadmissible in a jury trial. And that standard that I've quoted is taken from the Administrative Procedure Act, Iowa Administrative Procedure Act, because I think it encapsul encapsulates what uh, kind of the view of most arbitrators in determining whether to admit evidence or not. Um, of course, if the arbitrator is committed to the goals of economy and efficiency, which we would hope they would be, they will continue, just as a judge would, to exclude irrelevant, immaterial, or unduly repetitious evidence. Arbitrators do give effect to the rules of privilege recognized by law, so you needn't be concerned that if you are trying something uh, to an arbitrator rather than the court that all of a sudden you've waived attorney-client privilege or, or any other apl applicable privileges that might come up during the process. Anything else on evidence, Mike? Uh, no, I think that co okay. covers it very well. And then um, here, of course, between the barbed wire and the poor fellow tied up, why am I tied up? Well, you agreed to binding arbitration. As we know, no system is perfect. Uh, nothing works in all cases. So as part of that, 
let's talk about potential drawbacks of arbitration. Uh, and there are a few. You want to weigh these in terms of the type of case that you have and what may be anticipated. As we mentioned, reduced discovery. If your case requires extensive discovery, uh, perhaps that's not the best case for arbitration, although arbitrators oftentimes will work with the parties in terms of the discovery that may be helpful to get to the truth in the case. Uh, restricted access to injunctive relief. It's very difficult to get an arbitrator selected to have a preliminary award issued. Uh, make sure that that award is uh, binding uh, and to have that done in the same time frame and with the same authority that a court proceeding may allow, in a, especially in an emergency situation. Uh, and then we talked about limited judicial review. That being a potential benefit, but also a potential drawback, depending on the type of case that you're looking at. Um, there, you want to consider a couple things. If there are constitutional issues involved, for example, may not be the best case for arbitration. Um, as we discussed, the state grounds for review differ from uh, federal grounds to some extent. There is a broader standard of review in the state of Iowa uh, under 679A than there is under the Federal Arbitration Act, um, but also the fact that award is not uh, legal precedent. So if you need to and are looking to establish legal precedent in a case, may not be the best case for arbitration. Uh, but by and large, most cases are quite well suited to be determined by arbitration, and the courts will recognize and enforce uh, awards by an arbitrator. So in terms of best cases for arbitration, I think this was, I th I it's think your this was mine, yeah, <laughs> trying to figure out how to apportion these. <laughs> for best cases for arbitration, when speed to a determination is a priority. Okay, one of the great appeals mentioned time and time again in the court determinations, because as we've seen through court processes, especially federal courts, love arbitration. And um, one of the big benefits being the speed to determination, you get a decision made, uh, and that can be very important in some cases, and especially those involved in a business context. Uh, what we also find is in construction cases, need to get a decision made for a dispute while construction might be halted. Uh, concerns related to costs. It still does appear, aside from the conflicting uh, and potential controversy about cost in arbitration, that if arbitration is conducted in the manner in which it was intended, that uh, there's a significant cost savings, which would be a, a great benefit, we would think, in the, in the world that you folks work in, uh, especially when you have to consider outside counsel for perhaps extensive litigation in a case. Uh, flexibility. Arbitration, as we mentioned, provides tremendous flexibility. Rules, procedures, locations, decision maker, um, those all lend themselves to a much ad less adversarial and somewhat less bureaucratic role than the, than the courts sometimes can be. Uh, the need to preserve relationships of the parties. This is a huge benefit in business-to-business -business disputes. Oftentimes, there needs to be a determination made in something that's much less adversarial than what the court system would provide. And arbitration is a tremendous alternative to that. Uh, private and potentially confidential, we say that because um, typically arbitrations are private but not necessarily confidential unless a confidentiality agreement uh, is involved. And uh, this oftentimes is utilized, for example, in employment agreements where there may be confidentiality provisions, but employment disputes don't oftentimes lend themselves to the public forum of a court proceeding. Likewise, uh, shareholder disputes or disputes among businesses, trade secret issues, and what have you. And then finally, where the expertise of the arbitrator is beneficial. Marcia touched on this as well. Um, in circumstances where you want a decision maker that has experience in the particular issues that 
you're dealing with, uh, you don't want to necessarily uh, be submitting that decision to perhaps a newer judge that had never had experience in a case like that. Um, I remember at one point trying a, a prescriptive easement case in Washington County and going down there and the first thing the judge said that was assigned the case is, I'll just tell you, I've never had and I have absolutely no experience in prescriptive easement, don't know a thing about it, but I'll be trying your case. <laughs> Something to think about when it comes to who should be deciding the cases that you have. But those may be the best cases for arbitration to consider. And we're open to questions if you do have any uh, with respect to your individual challenges that you folks have. Okay. Well, now uh, we, it's, it's our understanding that our primary audience here is in house counsel. And so uh, I guess I'm here to suggest that. If arbitration is going to work and for you and your client, in large part, it's going to depend on the approach that you take to uh, arbitration. Clearly, the first thing that uh, you'll have to address in your position, uh, even before what we have on the slide, is whether you can anticipate as you uh, enter your uh, business enters into contractual re relationships, whether arbitration would be a uh, good thing to write into the contract and we'll get into some contractual and drafting issues later. So uh, that might be the early case assessment that I have here on the slide uh, is addressed to uh, post dispute analysis uh, when the disputes already arisen but it really it's just uh, as uh, applicable when you're drafting contracts and thinking ahead on what kind of disputes might arise. You're going to have to think about how does this dispute uh, affect business interests? Will important business interests um, be implicated? For example, do you need a precedent setting decision? I can remember uh, some cases that I had in private practice where a certain insurance clause was um, subject to some different interpretations and my client got to the point where they just wanted an answer from the court that was binding, precedent setting, so that they didn't have to continue to litigate it. Uh, so that's, that's an example of where you might have an issue that would militate against doing arbitration. It's always important, of course, how much time and money is the business prepared to devote to resolution of the dispute because the, the efficiencies and economies of arbitration are a selling point, but sometimes uh, there's more at stake than just the cost of the proceedings. So that's the kind of uh, analysis that you need to make when you're determining whether to write something, an arbitration clause into a contractor, or whether post-dispute you're going to approach the other party with a suggestion of arbitration. In the end, um, you have to ask yourself what dispute resolution process is likely to be the most effective given the concerns and priorities of your business. And sometimes that the, the information necessary to make that assessment isn't something you maybe uh, have to yourself. You might consider consulting other key persons as appropriate to get their input on uh, what the best business decision is with respect to uh, going the arbitration route. Another important aspect to be sure that arbitration is effective if you've decided to go that route is your relationship with outside counsel. Outside counsel have a natural tendency to do things the way they always have done them. I mean, we all are that way. And outside counsel, of course, really wants to achieve the best possible result for you, their client. And that leads them naturally to seek all the possible evidence that might be relevant, analyze every issue, and basically use every technique and procedure at their disposal. I mean, that's what's made litigation so expensive. So if you're employing outside counsel to represent you in the arbitration process, you will want to set the tone for the process at the very outset. And be sure that you choose outside counsel who shares your desire and is committed to efficiency and economy in the arbitration process. And then as the arbitration process proceeds, you need to be sure that you manage that process consistently with the cost-benefit assessment that you've made, 
keeping in mind the goals of economy, efficiency, efficiency and other business priorities. Because believe me, as things go, as the process goes along, you're going to be t tempted to uh, want to dig deeper or to depose ten people instead of four. And if you've made the decision ahead of time that cost and time is important, then you're going to have to handle those, answer those decisions, make those choices differently than you would in a normal trial process. And then finally, if you want to achieve the goals that you uh, identified in the beginning, your active ongoing involvement in the process is important. Consider participating in case management conferences and other important conferences and hearings. And most of those are done by phone, so your participation doesn't need to take a lot of time and effort. In particular, many decisions will be made at the pre-hearing conference that will affect the costs to be incurred and the speed with which the matter will be resolved. So your participation in that pre-hearing conference in particular can be influential and valuable in obtaining your business's objectives. Um, at the risk of incurring more costs, so you want to do this judicially, require periodic reports from outside counsel, and that can just be a phone call, so it doesn't have to cost a fortune of having a real report uh, written up. But kind of keep tabs on what's happening and where it's going. So if, if the railroad's going off the track, you can make a, a correction as soon as possible. Be involved in making important decisions regarding management of the process in order to achieve the desired goals. Anything you want to add to in-house counsel? Um, no, I think, that, I think okay. that covered it very well. And as Mike said earlier, we're happy to take uh, questions on any of this as we go along. All right, then we can talk about flexibility and variations in arbitration. Uh, this is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all uh, type of tool or approach. Um, for example, and we'll talk a little bit about alternatives, you can tailor the process as it may best suit the particular case that you have. And in terms of variations, we have the traditional arbitration approach, uh, which is uh, very similar to a court trial, for example, and um, one that uh, where evidence is submitted, there's opening statements and direct and cross-examination and closing argument, and then the arbitrator can issue an award, or the arbitrator does issue an award. The, one of the questions to consider is, is the arbitrator going to issue a brief award, which is authorized and enforceable, or is it going to be a more detailed, what we call reasoned award that describes the underlying findings and basis for the determination. But then there are several other variations too that apply in many cases uh, beneficially for the parties. Uh, Marcia touched on high-low agreements where the parties can decide ahead of time a floor and a ceiling to the particular issue if it's a claim for damages, for example. Arbitrator doesn't necessarily know what those, what those designations are. They just issue an award and then based on the party's agreement, the award stands within the range that the parties previously agreed upon. Uh, early neutral evaluation uh, provides counsel with the alternative to uh, understand the particular issues in the case and where the case might ultimately go without going through the entire process. And I have an example of that uh, in case you've never been involved with an early neutral evaluation. And it's not exactly, we call it a variation of arbitration, but I think it's more appropriately, appropriately uh, described as a way to use an extrajudicial process uh, to your advantage. The one time that I did work as an early, do an early neutral evaluation involved an ongoing uh, case. And it was uh, a company here in Iowa, their outside counsel and in-house counsel had been trying to settle uh, this lawsuit that was pending. And they were so far apart um, 
they were, I can't even remember now if they were the plaintiff or defendant, but in terms of negotiating the settlement, they were so far apart they had begun to doubt their own judgment and felt that there must be something they were missing. And so they uh, called me. They didn't tell me anything about the case itself, nothing about the uh, negotiations in the phone call. They just said, we're going to send you all the pleadings, all the discovery, uh, the contract that was being uh, litigated. I think that's about everything. Uh, they didn't send me their own assessments, nothing, just really the kind of uh, materials that a judge would see and asked me to give them some feedback on the legal issues and the factual issues. So I reviewed all of that and then I called them. I didn't write a report, so the expense of preparing something and writing wasn't involved. And we simply had a conversation. What was my evaluation of the legal and factual issues? And I think it was really interesting. There were some insights that I had simply because I wasn't involved in the process uh, the way they were that added a little objectivity that was useful to them uh, both in going back to the negotiating table and in how they would approach trying the case to a jury. So that's an example of how an early neutral evaluation might be used. And then uh, working our way to neutral fact finding, uh, this is something that we're seeing uh, being utilized a lot by uh, educational institutions, for example, but certainly would be a, a good tool for uh, in a corporate environment uh, or in the right type of case. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was called upon to make fact findings with respect to uh, a, a dispute between two tenured professors at a college uh, here in Iowa. And, um, and as part of that, an investigation is done and then a report is generated. Um, there's no award or determination necessarily made, but a factual determination as to the status of the claims uh, can be done, and then the case or the issue proceeds further through internal processes. Uh, likewise, um, we're seeing several of these types of fact-finding uh, avenues with respect to employment disputes or sexual harassment or sexual abuse claims where arbitrators um, may be called upon to uh, make findings with respect to an adjudication or a request for an investigation for uh, sexual harassment or sexual abuse. And I think you've been involved in some of those mm -hmm. as well. Right, Title IX adjudications. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly that would be an alternative and an option for, uh, for businesses and corporations to use as well. Mm -hmm. Likewise, adjudication of law points, and Marcia can describe, um, I think, one of, uh, an example of that, too, where sometimes the parties can't get to a resolution phase of their case because there's a legal issue that needs to be determined. Mm -hmm. Marcia, you can talk about that. Well, the one I was involved in didn't really start out as an adjudication of law points. I think an adjudication of law points can kind of be a standalone process, but the one I was involved in was just a traditional arbitration it was a contract dispute that involved a lot of money. And the parties hadn't been able to settle it, obviously. That's why they were proceeding with the arbitration. But they had three legal issues, the impact of an assignment and uh, a conflict of interest issue, and a third one that is not coming to me at this point. And so very early in the process, these issues were identified as ones that were going to have to be resolved before an award could be made. So the parties in a very short time frame uh, filed motions, filed briefs, and submitted it to me, and I issued a reasoned decision uh, on these motions for adjudication of law points. Once the party, and it was a binding arbitration, so these were this was a binding uh, decision, once the parties knew how those issues were resolved, they had the case settled in very short order. And so sometimes it's, uh, it can be points of law that are really the uh, hindrance in a dispute, and those can be resolved quite expeditiously by uh, using an arbitrator to do that. Certainly, and then and arbitrators go by different names as well. Oftentimes in insurance policies, and many of you folks probably work in that realm, 
Uh, there's a reference to an umpire and appraisers and what have you, but much of the similar similar type of decision making uh, is involved in those type of processes. And then, uh, and then the coexistence with mediation. At some, some circumstances, uh, parties want to have a determination. They want to have something done. They like the idea that mediation may be part of it, but um, at the end of the day, mediation may not resolve the case. So there's a couple variants uh, in that respect. One is ARB-MED. So in an ARB-MED situation, the parties submit the case to an arbitrator. The arbitrator seals the award and then at the request of the parties mediates the dispute. And at that point the award is determined. There is no potential for uh, ex parte information which oftentimes is involved in mediation in any way tainting the arbitrator's uh, decision. And that award is sort of held over the heads of the parties to uh, the point where, well, we'll mediate this. If we can't get it settled, here's your award, and the award is final. And so that's one alternative that's being used where the parties do want to have some input in mediation uh, towards a settlement, but want to make sure that it's, that it's being done and the case is over. Uh, MEDARB is another variant that oftentimes is used. Uh, there's a bit of a hazard with that in terms of the ex parte confidential communication that's involved in mediation. Because quite typically uh, in mediation the parties of course are separated, the mediator goes between them, and the mediator has to maintain the confidentiality of each. So in terms of a decision by that mediator who then changes hats to become an arbitrator, there are concerns because of the inability of the opposing party to respond to or submit evidence related to what the mediator heard in confidentiality from the other side. So there we talk about the benefit of having a different neutral do the arbitration if there's going to be a mediation and then followed by an arbitration if the case doesn't settle in mediation. Uh, and then finally mini trial just like it, it appears can be an expedited abbreviated submission of evidence um, to have a determination which sometimes is a non-binding one. We've been talking about binding arbitration here um, but you also have the alternative of non-binding arbitration as well. If that format is used you may want to put some teeth into it if one of the parties rejects the non-binding award that perhaps they have to better their situation by a certain amount or percentage or dollar amount um, otherwise the cost may be shifted or what have you. But uh, you don't want to just have an exercise in futility where you go through the process, uh, there's a non-binding award and one party says, so what, it doesn't really matter, so we'll just go back to the same <laughs> litigation routine we were before. And then This we, never happens, of course. This never <laughs> happens. We're here to litigate the arbitration clause that was meant to avoid litigation. Um, there's some law made on arbitration awards, arbitration agreements, of course. Nobody really wants to be in that position where they're dealing with litigation just to get to arbitration or to get um, to get to the meaning of the arbitration agreement. And so we're going to talk about drafting considerations that help to keep the arbitration in the context in which it was intended. And here we'll look at... You ready uh, for that? Yep, ready okay. for that. We'll go right into it. Um, things that you want to consider when you're drafting arbitration agreements. And spoke at the beginning about what agreements do you currently have arbitration clauses in, what kind of issues do you see coming up where arbitration clauses can be beneficial. Well, when you're thinking about that, we've got some drafting ideas for you. Uh, some things that we feel are important to include are set out here, and then we've got some additional optional terms. Uh, as far as, as terms that are important to include in an arbitration agreement, what is the scope of the dispute subject to arbitration? And oftentimes that's broadly defined, and we'll provide a sample of that um, arising out of the or relating to the terms of the contract, for example. 
um, but do you want a narrow scope for the arbitration clause or a broad scope? Uh, how are the arbitrators to be selected? Are you going to have a single arbitrator? Are you going to use a sponsoring organization? Or are you going to have a panel of three where there are two party selected arbitrators and the third is selected by the two party uh, appointed arbitrators? Uh, sponsoring organization, are you going to use AAA? Are you going to use JAMS? Uh, are you going to use Iowa Arbitration Association? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the location of the hearing, what are you going to put in as far as where the hearing is to be located? Um, if it's too far away for a claimant, that's sometimes subject to challenges as to unconscionability. Uh, oftentimes it might be helpful to put in some alternative locations or cities to try and avoid that. What rules are to be selected? Um, there you want to think about if there's a sponsoring organization, are you using their rules? Um, you can select the rules of the sponsoring organization if you choose, um, but, uh, but oftentimes it's helpful to designate the rules that will govern. And then likewise governing law. Is Iowa the governing law for the arbitration or is there a different uh, governing law that you're looking at? Finally, a very important one, judgment on the award. You want to provide for, and the Federal Arbitration Act requires as part of its enforceability, that judgment may be entered on the award by any court having competent jurisdiction. So you want to provide for court authority to enter a judgment on the award, which then becomes enforceable as any other judgment. There are some additional optional terms. Uh, you can require a negotiation or mediation before the arbitration. And, and let me jump in here because we have a question that's kind of related to that. Sure. It's, it, the question is, do the variations of arbitration need to be set out in the contract that commits the parties to arbitration, or are the variations agreed to after the arbitration has begun? Certainly, and a good question. It can be either. If it's a pre-dispute arbitration agreement, then the variations can be described in the arbitration agreement. For example, the meet arb, arb med, uh, high low provisions can be set out um, in the pre dispute arbitration agreement. It's and it's probably pretty customary, at least I've seen a lot of arbitration provisions, to require the parties to go to mediation before you do the arbitration. Yes. So the, arbitra the mediation arbitration is a fairly common sequence, but yeah, you can certainly include some of these other more exotic forms. So yeah, so you can include them in a pre-dispute agreement or what oftentimes happens is once the dispute has arisen that the parties make a decision that here's how we want to modify the underlying arbitration agreement. And is very effective when it comes to uh, after the arbitration has begun or after the dispute has arisen because now you're seeing something concrete instead of trying to predict the future as to what may be the best alternative there. Um, and then moving through there and uh, triggering requiring negotiation or mediation beforehand, as Marcia indicated, that's oftentimes customary in these provisions. Mm -hmm. Confidentiality, you can incorporate. The limitations on discovery can be identified. Two depositions for each side, for example. Um, limiting motion practice to issues of law and, um, and whether or not discovery is permitted likewise can be incorporated in there. And then remedies as well. And many businesses and corporations are using arbitration agreements to limit remedies uh, such as including class action waivers, uh, caps on damages, and some other things too. So those are some options as well. And I think Marsha will address a few more. Well, one obvious uh, option to include when you're drafting arbitration provision are deadlines for completion of the process. Uh, in other words, ensuring from the very beginning that you're going to have a, a quick process that will be efficient and economical. And so um, these deadlines can be the form of 
the, uh, the arbitration will be completed within 100 days from notice of arbitration if you anticipate simple disputes. Maybe if the contract anticipates more complex matters, um, you'll want to have a, a one-year deadline. There uh, are often provisions in these uh, contracts for apportionment of the arbitrator fees and costs, as well as uh, providing that the uh, attorney fees are a part, can be part of the award. And then the last point uh, or issue that you might consider addressing is the option of having a reasoned award. I think Mike talked about that. Um, a reasoned award is going to be more like a traditional court judgment, and I can speak from great authority that that takes a lot of can take a lot of time to write a reasoned award. Um, and so you may just want want to say a two-page award so that you're not paying for a long reasoned award. But I, I just I do want to say this, just judging on my judicial experience, that requiring a reasoned award has a benefit other than just allowing the parties to know why they won and wh or why they lost. It's sometimes easy to look at the evidence, read the law, and, and come to a conclusion that you think is right and required by the law. But when a judge has to sit down or an arbitrator and actually write out the logical sequence of reasoning that leads to that result, that is where you can catch a flaw in your reasoning. I mean, there were times I'd write an opinion and I'd be halfway through and I'm thinking, I'm wrong. I can't, this, this isn't coming out the way, it's not logical or it's not consistent with the law. So there, are, there is value to a reasoned award uh, just in terms of the quality of the decision making that I wanted to point out. Um, this slide uh, we won't go through in detail. It simply gives you some, a resource for rules that you may want to incorporate into your um, agreement. I'm doing one now under the uh, International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution. I think they have a, a nice set of rules. Clearly some of these are much more involved than others, so you might take a look at, um, at all of these as, as uh, possibilities. Now we have, am I talking about these, Mike, or are you? You don't have much time, so. I think we've got uh, this on, on me? you, Marcia. Okay, all right. We have two sample provisions here. And just by operation of the fact that we have a slide and we're not privy to the particular disputes that you might anticipate, uh, this is a pretty abbreviated arbitration clause. Exactly, yes. Um, and I would say this is the minimum that you'd ever want to put in your contract, but at least uh, it should be sufficient to require binding arbitration if in fact a future dispute arises. But as, as we talked about in the prior slides, there are many other things that you can include in an arbitration clause to ensure that it has the efficiencies, economies, or other benefits such as confidentiality that you find important. Are we running out of time a little bit? Uh, this is a sample clause to use with an existing dispute. I guess the same comments uh, that I just made, you'll, um, you'll want to consider all these optional agreements that will ensure that you reach the desired goals. Um, this we put in here just in case you haven't been involved with arbitration and you wonder, well, how the heck does this operate? It couldn't be simpler. One party serves a written demand for arbitration uh, on the other party, specifying the nature of the dispute, the amount in controversy, and that is submitted with the written arbitration agreement to the uh, arbitrator chosen by the parties or attorneys. Or if you're using a sponsoring organization, that would be submitted to the sponsoring organization who would then assist you in choosing the arbitrator or a three-member panel. As I said, the, the one thing that happens fairly early in the arbitral pro process is a pre-hearing conference, and that's where all of the logistics are addressed. If the agreement of the parties hasn't provided for rules or procedures, uh, anything that needs to be filled, any gaps that need to be filled in will happen there. So that's something that you'll want to be sure to participate in. And uh, finally, we, we want to make a little bit of a pitch for Iowa Arbitration Association. 
this is a group that was formed by Marcia, myself, and former Justice Linda Newman. Uh, what we were trying to do is meet the needs for, of the Iowa attorneys and parties for an Iowa-based arbitration association um, that also adopts uh, rules based on the Iowa uh, arbitration statutes. And um, this is uh, the idea is to promote flexibility and informality and speed to resolution. Uh, as you'll note, if you look at the website, uh, www.iowaarbitrators.com, we have a panel of six highly qualified uh, decision makers and arbitrators. Feel free to take a look. Um, Marcia and I are available to talk and answer any questions that you have. Uh, we also are available to consult with respect to drafting arbitration agreements or addressing the best forms to use or in any arbitration context. So feel free to give us a call. I think our contact information is in bios set out in the materials that you receive. And it looks like we are running out of time. Are there any questions that we can address at this point? Paula says no. Well, we hope you enjoyed your lunch uh, while you're, you have been listening to us, and I hope that you have found some uh, valuable nugget of information that will make your jobs easier. Thank you yes. for joining us. Thank you very much. Good luck. Take care.